Let us read together in the scriptures as recorded by Paul to the church at Ephesus, page 1176 in the Bible that is available for use in church, page 1176, Ephesians chapter 4, and we want to read from verse 7 through to the end of the chapter. And there is a connection, I believe, between 7 through to 16 and then what follows, uh, because uh, Paul is talking about growing to maturity in the verses we're going to be looking at this evening, and that involves putting off certain things, certain sins, and it involves putting on a certain uh, fruit and of the Spirit certain virtues, and so, in a very real sense, we could keep preaching our way through Ephesians uh, for months uh, to come. But tonight is our final. But grace was given to each one of us according to the measure of Christ's gift. Therefore it says, when he ascended on high, he led a host of captives, and he gave gifts to men. In saying he ascended, what does it mean but that he had also descended into the lower regions, the earth? He who descended is the one who also ascended far above all the heavens, that he might fill all. And he gave some apostles, some prophets, some evangelists, some shepherds and teachers, to equip the saints for the work of ministry, for building up the body of Christ, until we all attain to the unity of the faith and to the knowledge of the Son of God, to mature manhood, to the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ, so that we may no longer be children, tossed to and fro by the waves and carried about by every wind of doctrine, by human cunning, by craftiness in deceitful schemes. Rather, speaking the truth, or literally it is truthing in love, we are to grow up in every way into him who is the head into Christ, from whom the whole body joined and held together by every joint with which it is equipped, when each part is working properly, makes the body grow so that it builds itself up in love. Now this I say and testify in the Lord, that you must no longer walk as the Gentiles do in the futility of their minds. They are darkened in their understanding, alienated from the life of God because of the ignorance that is in them due to their hardness of heart. They have become callous and have given themselves up to sensuality, greedy to practice every kind of impurity. But that is not the way you learned Christ. Assuming that you have heard about him and were taught in him as the truth is in Jesus, to put off your old self, which belongs to your former manner of life, and is corrupt through deceitful desires, and to be renewed in the spirit of your minds, and to put on the new self created after the likeness of God in true righteousness and holiness. Therefore, having put away falsehood, let each one of you speak the truth with his neighbour, for we are members one of another. Be angry and do not sin. Do not let the sun go down on your anger and give no opportunity to the devil. Let the thief no longer steal, but rather let him labour, doing honest work with his own hands so that he may have something to share with anyone in need. Let no corrupting talk come out of your mouths, but only such as is good for building up as fits the occasion that it may give grace to those who hear. Do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God, 
by whom you were sealed for the day of redemption. Let all bitterness and wrath and anger and clamour and slander be put away from you along with all malice. Be kind to one another, tender hearted, forgiving one another as God and Christ forgave you. Therefore, be imitators of God as beloved children. Amen. We have been thinking together both last Lord's Day and today about how to preserve the unity that Christ has brought us all into in salvation and within the family of the saved, the church of which he is head. And we have noted, uh, starting last Lord's Day morning, that we are to live out our calling, verses 1 to 3. That's vital if we're going to preserve unity. We saw last Lord's Day evening, we are to imitate the triune God, who is marked by a series of ones in each of the three persons of the Trinity as he deals with us. We saw this morning that we are to pursue and deepen our unity as we appreciate each other's gifts, gifts that differ. The gifts of teaching that is placed in the ministry uh, and in eldership and the gifts of service that are given to all other believers for the works of ministry so that the body will grow together. And now tonight, we want to develop that idea of growing together further as Paul uh, speaks to us now about growing to maturity. That's the title of our sermon tonight, Grow to Maturity. And by that Paul means grow to corporate family maturity. We're not thinking here about my maturity and this person's maturity and that person's maturity and somebody else's maturity. We're thinking as scripture primarily does about the maturity that happens within the body of Christ. And that is balanced maturity. Uh, and it preserves us from going off on our own little hobby horses and our own trajectories and tangents um, uh, that can cause us to be unbalanced. Heather and I have been blessed to be parents to five children. They're now adults, uh, all between 21 and 30. And we continually thank God for our children and for their unity as siblings. And of course, that's not something to be taken for granted at any stage in family life. When they're toddlers, they can, children can, fight the bit out. And when they become teenagers, they can become so confident in themselves that there's constant conflict one with the other. But thank God that rarely have we seen that. And even as they entered their late teens. However, sometimes in adulthood, siblings that have been united in childhood and teenage years become utterly disunited. And sometimes I think the same pattern occurs in churches, in new churches. In the early years, Members get along on the whole. Um, they get along well. But then after uh, a number of years, um, opinions can become stronger and arguments can increase and divisions can appear in the church. And beyond that, there can be some tragic verbal uh, bust-ups Yes, in the church, 
that leads to a complete breakdown in relationships. Now these are not the things that God intends or for which Christ purchased his church. So what is the problem when adult siblings row and separate, sometimes breaking the heart of elderly parents? And what is the issue when members of God's family fall out and separate? Well, I want to suggest that it is at root and inevitably a lack of maturity as individuals and as the church. So in verses 13 to 16, Paul teaches us the need to grow, grow to maturity as churches. And uh, from uh, chapter 4 verse 17 to 5 verse 21, he spells out the sins to be avoided and the conduct to be pursued. If this maturity is to become a reality, if it is to become embedded in the church and be a feature for which the church is renowned. So as I said earlier, we're not going to look at 17 to 521, but we would derive great benefit in our own lives if we were to, to take time to look at that over uh, the next week and, and coming days. Let's then this evening think now in particular about growing to maturity. Growing to maturity. The gifts Christ gives to his church, that of teaching um, and of serving, that of ministers and members, these gifts are given not for our personal benefit or our personal glory, but they are given for the maturity of the church. Pastors and teachers are a gift to the church for the maturity of the church to help you grow up in Christ as a body. And the gifts that Christ has given to you. They are given so that the church will also grow to maturity by the use of those. Look at how Paul puts it here when he writes until verse 13 we all attain to the unity of the faith, not talking about our personal faith now, but of the Christian faith, the apostolic faith, and of the knowledge of the Son of God. And this word attain, it's used of travellers making a journey and reaching their destination. And so we are on a journey together in Christ. And the destination, the end point, is maturity in Christ as a body of believers. Where we have a unity of the faith. And there's no evident glaring division in what we believe. And there's no, there's a unity in the knowledge of the Son of God. We're not at sixes and sevens in terms of our understanding of Christ and who he is and what he has done and what he is doing from heaven and what he will do when he comes again. We're on a journey, brethren. And so Paul uses another phrase then. He talks about to a mature person. Notice um, it's not a perfect and that's a poor translation if it is in your Bible it's not a perfect person there is no such thing as a perfect person except the man Jesus 
and you will never reach perfection in this life. Beware of those who try to teach you that you can. As we'll see in a moment, that's a bad doctrine. Uh, but um, we are to be, we are come to a mature person. And you remember that's the picture that Paul uses of the, of the church. The church is a mature person. That's what Christ intends her to be. He intends her to be his body. She's one person. And so the contrast here is mature as opposed to childish. Um, and um, until she is a mature person. Um, so he goes on then and he adds to the measure of Christ's full stature. And he's saying now think of Christ. Think of the fullness that is in him. There's nothing that can be added to him. It's the same word as we have in Matthew. Can you add a cubit to your stature? And of course, there's nothing that can be added uh, to the person of Christ. But that's the standard. That's the, that's the reality. That's who we want to become like. It's a feature of children, is it not? That they like to imitate. And often it is their father or their mother or an older brother or older sister or perhaps it is somebody who is a kind of hero well you and I we are to have a hero and it's not Ronaldo and his football skills or it's not um, some pop group it's not some philosopher like Richard Dawkins uh, or somebody who's worldly wise it is to be Christ, Christ. And the purpose of Christ for you and for me and for us together is that we will come to the measure of his fullness. That's a remarkable thought. How wonderful it is that when Christ saves us, he doesn't leave us where we were. He begins a process of change. And the chief place where he will effect that change is not you in your little corner and me in my little corner. Yes, there is a place, there's a time and a place for going into the closet and shutting the door and being with our Father in heaven. But the chief place where God shapes us and molds us into the image and likeness of Christ is in the church. In the church. And so until the church becomes like her Saviour and Lord. So we see this emphasis then on maturity. And of course we know from our children that maturity doesn't happen overnight. Maturity doesn't happen in a vacuum. It takes a period of time. It takes a long time, as you who are parents know. And as we know about ourselves, if we know ourselves. But also, it happens in a context. And so, the maturity of this congregation, it will take time. And it will happen as we continue to meet together and not neglect the assembling together of the Lord's people. So, Christian maturity is not as um, um, too many often think an individual goal. It's not a personal goal per se. It's the church's shared goal. And within the church, yes, we're to have that goal and objective. I want to mature within the body. That's how our children mature. When they rub shoulders with others. They've got to get on with others. And they've got to know, give and take and they've got to relate to others and learn from others. 
and the child that takes himself off and buries himself in his books and in books or whatever from morning to night is typically not a mature child. They're very infantile. So maturity cannot be achieved on one's own by private scripture reading or by private prayer or online ministries. Yes, there's a place for those. But bear in mind that our brethren in the Old Testament and in the New Testament, they didn't have the scriptures. So how did they mature? They took on board the things they heard on the Lord's day. And they prayed those into their lives. And they worked them out in their lives together. So let's think then about how we're to grow in maturity or grow to maturity with that long but I think necessary introduction with three brief points that we want to make. We grow to maturity by sound doctrine. By sound doctrine. And sound doctrine is doctrine defined in scripture. It's doctrine that is expounded uh, and applied from scripture again by those whom God has called and equipped and gifted and to be um, honest with you and to be frank with you the ordinary individual believer does not have that ability in and of themselves to get a rounded theology, a rounded doctrine. We need the church. Look at what Paul says. No longer being children or infants is another way of putting it. That's what it literally is. It means the infant or it means the, the infant that has not yet reached the stage of puberty. Again, we know from our families how easy it is for children to be influenced and to be led astray. You see it when your child starts going to school. You see it when if you were to set out a table of food and there's sandwiches and there's cakes and there's buns, what will the child go for? The child uh, doesn't know uh, and it goes, it's attracted by what looks nice and what's tasty and sweet and so easily influenced by what it sees. If you set down a range of parcels and you wrap one in brown paper and the others were all in glitzy paper of Superman or uh, uh, Barbie or whatever depending on the child that is in question, guarantee they'll not go for the brown paper one because it's not attractive to the eye. And you see, they haven't learned to say, well, actually, the attractive and the best thing could be in the brown paper. And the nutrition is there in the sandwiches, not in the cakes and the pastries. And so they're drawn by initial impressions, by outward appearance. And so Paul says, that's a feature as well of Christians when they're young. And if you're a young Christian, you need to watch out for that. Because you can be like the child in your spiritual. You're trying to buy what is big and bright and uh, what is impressive, what looks good, what sounds good, but it may not be good. So Paul adds to that then, tossed to and fro and carried about um, um, in confusion. The picture here is of the little boat and the storm is raging and the boat is making no progress it's just swirling around swirling around being battered up and down making no progress and so Paul says uh, that too is, is, is what we can be like um, if we are not receiving sound doctrine. And how does this happen? How does this come about? This, this um, absence of maturity and this uh, being like children and being swirling around like the little boat in the storm. Well, 
there's always an outside influence. There's always an outside influence. So the wind is driving the boat. And it's what's there on the table that's driving the desires of the child. And so Paul goes on to say, by cunning people, and literally it is, by trickery. And we might compare it to, we might say, by the magician. It's that kind of idea. Um, one of my lasting memories from primary school is the magician coming. And he could catch your nose like this. And he could have pennies flowing out of your nose. Of course, the pennies weren't flowing out of your nose. It was by sleight of hand. It was by trickery. And Paul says there are religious teachers. And that's what they do. They take you and they have you thinking that there's something good coming out of you. Whereas they are just um, manipulating you to get their ends, to get control of you. By deceitfulness. This is another interesting word. It's the word that was used in the Old Testament. The equivalent was Joshua 9 verse 4. The Gibeonites came in deceitfulness. They were wearing old clothes, dirty, shabby, torn. And their bread was mildewed and, and their um, wineskins were cracking. And so they said, well, well we are, we're from far away. We've made a long journey. And notice Joshua. Joshua, the servant of God, who'd been alongside Moses, who had seen so much, he was taken in. None of us need to think that we are beyond the work of um, false teachers controlled by the devil in their trickery and in their deceitfulness that they couldn't swipe, sweep us off our feet in something they say. Jesus used the word, this very word, in Luke 20, verse 23 of the Pharisees, when they come with a question. He recognized that they were coming in deceitfulness, wanting to trap Jesus, wanting to get him over on their side. And Jesus stood firm because he was grounded in sound doctrine. And so Paul concludes towards the scheme of of error. So we need to grow to maturity by the avoidance of false doctrine, by standing in sound doctrine. And that sound doctrine comes in the church. Yes, sometimes there is the need for and there is the provision of a class for doctrine. But the best class for doctrine is the preaching of the word of God an expository preaching in the books of scripture. And so brethren, um, we can make no apology for saying that you are going to hear doctrine from this pulpit because that's what will keep you from swirling around like a little boat in all the things that are chucked at you out there in the world, in your workplace, on the media, uh, in the... Uh, in, 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 the, in your uh, educational establishments. Do not be dissuaded by false ideas. Do not be swayed by the teaching of religious people. We have the cults today. They're very active in our community. Interestingly, during lockdown, the one body that was sending literature into homes is what? Jehovah's Witnesses. I got a letter. Here in Fermanagh. I know others did as well. And so, let's not be deceived. They, they do it by trickery. They deny the deity of Christ and the work of Christ by trickery, sleight of hand, and by deceitfulness. So, grow to maturity by sound doctrine. Be like the Bereans. Test all things against Scripture. If we are teaching the truth, we will have no reason to be afraid of you getting out the scriptures and checking out what we say from the scriptures themselves in a humble attitude and looking to God. But then secondly, let's notice grow to maturity by sincere love. 
by a sincere love. And we go now to verse 15, where Paul says in the opening words, Rather or but speaking the truth in love. That's something you need always to pray for myself as a pastor, for Trevor as an elder, for the interim elders, that we will always speak the truth in love. But it applies to you as well. Yes, it applies to the teaching ministry. But yes, it applies to the use of your service gifts within the church. Speaking the truth in love. Literally it is truthing in love. And it's that idea, keeping on truthing, continually truthing. In other words, there's never to be a time when we speak truth to someone that it's not done in an attitude of love. That's in the church. The danger is that as we learn sound doctrine, we become arrogant and proud. And when we speak to the person who hasn't got a, as good a mind to hold sound doctrine, or perhaps they are young in the faith, and they say something that is wrong, and you or I respond with harshness. We respond with a sharpness to our speech that causes that believer to just wilt and crawl like a snail back into their shell. They're thinking, why did I ever come out of my shell? And brethren, if anyone were to feel like that in our congregation about me or about you, that will not help the body grow. We're not to jump all over people or over one another in the pursuit or cause of truth. We never find our Saviour doing that with his disciples. And when a Christian says something wrong, uh, that we, or something that we know to be inaccurate or incorrect, yes, we need to, we need to respond to that. Generally, that's the case. But we need to also think about how we respond to that. When we respond to that. Is it the place to challenge somebody in front of others? Is it the place to put somebody down? Is it right to have a, a full-blown debate one-to-one -one in about some doctrine in the presence of the whole group that may well be a tangent to what the study is about or what the, uh, the time together is about. You know, I think there's better ways of doing it. And I think we see those better ways in Scripture. We're told that Aquila and Priscilla, Acts 18, they hear a pause in the synagogue. They didn't stand up and say, Apollos, you're wrong. You've, you haven't got it fully. Sit down, Apollos. They didn't make a protest in the church service. No, we read that they took him aside. They got alongside him afterwards and they encouraged him in what he had to say. But they said to him, Apollos, there's some things you need to, you need to develop your thinking further. There's things that you haven't taken into account. And so they spent time with him. Or think about Paul with the disciples of John in Acts 19. Here's people and John or Paul comes to them in Ephesus and they admit baptism. We know nothing about baptism apart from John's baptism. And by the way, that's a good indication that John's baptism and Christian baptism are two different things. But that's another for another night. So we've heard nothing but 
Do you want smart person? What does Paul do? Does he lambast them? Does he put them down? No, he explains to them. And the Holy Spirit honours what Paul does. And the Holy Spirit comes upon them. Again, so that these disciples of John are integrated into the one church. And there's not a John the Baptist church. As well as a Samaritan church. And a Cornelius, the Gentile church. No, there's one church. And so, brethren, truthing in love. Truth and love always belong together. Always belong together. So, if we are going to preserve our unity, if we're going to deepen that unity, we need to grow to maturity through sound doctrine, through sincere, genuine love for one another as we talk to one another about our faith and as we discuss the things of God. But then thirdly, by selfless service. Not self-service, but selfless service. Paul's concern in the rest of verse 15 and verse 16 uh, is the body's growth. And that this maturity in doctrine and this maturity in love, it will then, uh, as the people use their gifts and as the minister uses his gifts and the elders alongside him, it will produce what? Verse 15, me. We may grow up to Christ in all. But we may grow up into Christ in all. I think that means in all areas of the Christian life. Remember I said before that when we study on our own, it's so easy. And you've seen it, I've seen it. And somebody gets an idea in their mind and they research it and they think about it. And they get themselves in a trajectory. But in the church, there's something wrong. It, with the ministry, if it doesn't cause us to grow up in Christ in all areas of doctrine and practice. It's to be a balanced diet in order to create and cause growth. Just like your children when they are growing up. You don't want to see their nose growing like Pinocchio's nose. So that it becomes a caricature and a fun is made of them. You don't want to see their arms becoming like Mr. Tickle's arms. That they're so long that they could wrap themselves around the whole body. No, you, there's something wrong if either the nose or the arms or the ears were to grow out of proportion. And so there's to be a growth that is proportionate right across the body. In all areas of our spiritual life. The church grows not only through a good diet. But also or a good diet of truth taught and digested. But also through a good workout. And that's what Paul goes on to say then in verse 16. From whom the whole body joined and held together by every joint with which it is equipped. Each part is working properly. Each part is doing its share. There's a workout. And so the message that you hear each Lord's Day, it's not about going home tonight and saying, well, back to work tomorrow. We can find that all away. No, there's got to be a workout now. The next six days. And um, I want to, I would encourage you, um, as I used to do in my own life and still do as a minister now, to take the points of the sermon, to think about them, the sermons, to think about them, to pray them into your life, because that's how we grow as a body. 
And when we're all doing that, and I believe actually that we need to get the balance struck again between our own personal Bible reading and the public ministry of the Word. We're living in an age today when personal Bible reading is held up as at the expense of the preaching of the Word. And so what I learn in my Bible study, well that's, I can contradict actually the leaders of the church if they want. Because I'm a taught man or woman. Paul says, no, no. We're taught men and women by the public ministry on the Lord's day. And you see, that will preserve us again from becoming disunited with the church. When we get off on our own little tangent and we elevate our own Bible reading above the ministry of the word, we're on a road that at sooner or later is going to cause a clash with the leadership of the church. And that's to everybody's damage. So, Paul says then that as we are taught together, we work it out together. In the days which lie ahead, pray it into our lives, begin to live it out in our lives. We begin to think, how can I put this into practice with the other members of the church? So as each part works selflessly, the body grows. Notice the words again, in love, in love. It's striking that Paul begins this whole section and ends this section um, with um, the words, in love. So let's try and bring it all together then. We're talking about preserving our unity. We're talking about deepening our unity and becoming a mature body, having the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ. That's something that happens when we come together and we learn together and we live together through sound doctrine, through sincere love and through selfless service. And notice brethren in closing, and this isn't assumed, but we should never assume anything. We need to state it. So I'm going to state it at the close. Notice that every one of these things are done in Christ. In Christ. It all centers around him. Who he is. And what he has done and what he is doing in us. The unity flows from Christ. It takes place in the body of Christ. Its goal is the fullness of Christ uh, in us. Uh, and uh, to then grow the body of Christ, the church, further. So brethren, let us reach forward together to preserve our unity as we grow to maturity, as a church, as a body, in Christ and of Christ. Amen.